Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Bonus episode, The Antikythera Shipwreck. During Easter week in April of 1900, two ships from the island of Semi named Efterpi and Calliope were sailing along the waters between Kythera and Crete, its crew en route to North Africa in order to ply their trade as sponge divers, just as the harvesting season was about to begin. In the process of their crossing, the sky darkened, and the waves began to churn from the force of the strong winds that were rolling in. Fearing the awful power of a Mediterranean storm, Captain Demetrios Kontos ordered that they seek refuge among the shores of the nearby island of Antikythera, less than a few hundred kilometers from Athens. The tempest soon subsided, and some of the divers decided to get an early start at their collection along the coastline. A commotion soon broke out as diver Ilias Stadiatis frantically called out to the captain for assistance. Kontos followed Stadiatis some 50 meters below the waters, and upon their return, the captain brought aboard the arm of a life-sized bronze sculpture. Rather than finding a bountiful harvest of sponges, Kontos and his crew had discovered the remains of a ship that was destroyed at sea nearly 2,000 years before, known thereafter as the Antikythera Shipwreck. This turned out to be one of the most important archaeological finds of the early 20th century, providing a veritable treasure trove of artistic works all dating to the Hellenistic period including the famous Antikythera Mechanism, the world's oldest known analog computer. In antiquity, Antikythera was known as Aegilia, and for much of the Hellenistic period it was a den for pirates. The Rhodian navy was responsible for keeping them in check for much of the 3rd and 2nd centuries, but the pirates of Aegilia and the rest of the Mediterranean were utterly destroyed in the naval campaigns of Pompey the Great in 67 BC. It largely remained an unimportant region afterwards, but fell under control of the modern state of Greece in the mid-19th century after passing through the hands of multiple powers. Captain Kontos and his team chose to contact the Greek authorities to alert them of their discovery, though the exact timeline of events is something of a mystery. According to anecdotal evidence, a telegraph was sent to the government in Athens only a few days afterwards to alert them of the find but it was allegedly disregarded as the nonsensical ramblings of a drunkard. It was not until November of that year that Kontos and his men visited Athens to officially request a meeting with the Minister of Education, Spiridon Stais, seeking the financial backing necessary to help recover the goods in the shipwreck. As proof, the crew presented Stais the bronze arm, which was enough to get the green light to move forward with the expedition, as reported in the Athenian newspaper Toasti, on November 24th. In spite of this rather patriotic act, a more cynical point of view would suggest that Kontos had been angling to get a potentially lucrative contract with the government. It's worth noting that the official delegation took place just as the sponge harvesting season ended, and they had mistakenly gave the wrong location when making their pitch to Stais, presumably in an effort to secure exclusive rights. Another anecdote reportedly taken from the descendants of these divers suggests that some of the smaller goods had been retrieved upon initial discovery, later to be sold in the Egyptian markets. Regardless of where their interests may have lain, the divers performed admirably in the uncomfortable and outright dangerous conditions from November of 1900 to September of 1901. Diving technology was still rather primitive. Think of your stereotypical copper fishbowl helmets along with the bulky suit and the teams responsible for making the descent could only remain in the water for a maximum of eight minutes. Decompression sickness was rampant among the divers, and one unfortunate worker died outright. The natural processes of erosion, sedimentation, and choppy weather contributed further to the problem, as many of the artifacts were submerged in several tons worth of sand, or calcified and stuck to rocks. The divers nearly quit in February, citing a lack of new finds, but Minister Stais convinced them to continue onwards with additional payment, as he was confident that more objects lay hidden. He was ultimately correct, but the limitations in technology meant that they had to call it quits by the end of that summer. Following its initial discovery, the Antikythera shipwreck would again remain undisturbed for another several decades. It wasn't until 1976 that a new expedition would take place off the island, 
this time headed by famed underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau. Not as much material was found by Cousteau when compared to Contos and his team, but the evidence that turned up in the attempt would prove to be invaluable in actually dating the wreckage. While we have talked about the background behind the discovery, let us more closely examine the ship and its contents. The vessel in question was approximately 40 meters in length, and its nearly 300 tons worth of cargo contained some impressive pieces. Two bronze statues known as the Aphiba, Youth, and the Philosopher are some of the only surviving examples of the lost wax technique of bronze metalworking, and the Philosopher's arm was the first artifact to be pulled from the water. In addition to these large bronzes, over 36 Parian marble statues of various sizes and states of preservation have also been found, and an enormous marble head of the god Heracles was recovered as recently as June 2022. Perhaps the most important item to have been recovered is what is known as the Antikythera Mechanism. While we will spend a substantial amount of time discussing the functionality of the mechanism in future episodes, careful analyses and reconstructions suggest that this is the earliest surviving example of an analog computer, using a series of mechanical gears to calculate the motion of celestial bodies for a multitude of purposes. Never mind the sheer luck which enabled the survival and recovery of this magnificent object, it might have been lost to us again due to human error. According to an anecdote by the expedition's admiral, Ioannis Theophanidis, the lump-like remains of the mechanism were so corroded that one of the sailors nearly tossed it back overboard, thinking it was a rock, only to be stopped when another officer recognized the metal among the calcification. While less flashy than the sculptures and mechanism, many of the smaller items reveal the cargo's cosmopolitan makeup. Beautiful bits of glasswork can be traced back to Syrian or Egyptian workshops. Several empty amphorae, presumably used to hold wine, were taken from Rhodes, Kos, Ephesus, and eastern Italy. The remains of three couches contain wood harvested from Greek chestnut, Persian walnut, and ash trees. Hints from the specifications of the Antikythera mechanism suggest that it was commissioned for production in either Rhodes or Epirus. A handful of gold jewelry and other precious metals were also found amongst the debris, though it was quite possible that this belonged to one of the victims of the shipwreck. Speaking of which, we also found the remains of some of its passengers. Cousteau's investigation in the 1970s yielded the bones of at least four separate individuals, three male and one possibly female and more skeletons have been found in the past few years. One of the strangest items unearthed in the last decade was the lid of a red marble sarcophagus. It is not clear if it belonged to an original occupant who now resided in a watery grave, or if it was being shipped for a prospective buyer on land for their own eventual demise. How and when did the wreckage end up at the bottom of the sea? What was the ship's original destination? Almost all scholars have agreed that the date of its destruction took place somewhere in the starting half of the 1st century BC, a time frame reinforced by Cousteau, who discovered over 80 coins that were minted in a handful of sites across Asia Minor. The oldest were bronze coins from Nidus and Ephesus from the 3rd and 2nd centuries, but the newer silver coins were from Pergamon and Ephesus, with the latest being minted no later than 65 BC. Given that much of the cargo was from the eastern Mediterranean, it stands to reason that the ship was bound for Italy. The initial discovery of the bronze statues, which predate the wreck by at least a century, led to the hypothesis that this was a Roman ship bringing back plunder taken from a Greek city, like Sulla's sack of Athens in 86, or the eastern campaigns of Lucullus and Pompey in the 70s and 60s, which would fit rather neatly with the suggested timeline. The inclusion of more mundane items that have been found in the last few decades have given credit to the idea that this was a merchant ship instead, and that the ship must have stopped at either Ephesus or one of the nearby cities before its departure for eager Italian markets. As I stated earlier, pirates were a common sight near Antikythera, and the region was a traffic lane for commercial vessels plump with goods as they made their way from the Aegean to the Adriatic. The ship appears to have been capable of protecting itself, as one of the items recently recovered was a large bulb-shaped piece of bronze known as a dolphin. Any hostile ships that intended to board could find the dolphin dropped from the mast of the defending party onto their own decks, causing serious bodily harm or ripping a hole right through their own hull. 
No evidence suggests that this ship was destroyed in combat, however. And perhaps, like the Samian divers, they too fell victim to the stormy weather, weighed down by their heavy cargo. In retrospect, the Antikythera shipwreck was treated as a sensation at the time of its initial discovery, but quickly petered out in the following years, mostly due to limitations in diving equipment preventing deeper exploration. It only gained further prominence in the late 20th century when the famed mechanism began to be better understood and publicly recognized as a major symbol of the technological sophistication of the ancient world. Outside of the mechanism, the ship also provides a good picture of the late Hellenistic economy, showing the interconnectedness of the Mediterranean world that would continue to develop under the dominion of Rome. With the bone fragments and teeth recovered from the site, the question of DNA sequencing has been raised as a way to test and see if we can trace the genetic origins of the ship's crew. Scholars also still believe that there is more to be discovered in the deep. Starting in 2012, a new project called Return to Antikythera has continuously revealed new items over the last decade as they combed over the wreckage, including statues and possible additional pieces of the mechanism. Whether we will find something so revolutionary is unclear, but who knows how many secrets remain buried after 2,000 years.